you know, if you were a business, every year, a business at, at the end of the year, they will tell you how many assets they have, whether they're liabilities, what's their income, what's their expenses. Why do we not do that as individuals? See, that's a little further than a budget. Budget yeah. is what comes in, what comes out. But how about every year seeing, is my net worth increasing? Okay, am I saving some? You say, what are my assets this year? Are my liabilities gone down? Or am, am, am I making more money? Am I spending less? And that's hard. I mean, things keep getting more expensive. But again, a business does that all the time. Why as an individual do we not measure from year to year where we're going? Back to another episode on the Wealth and Price Show, a show where we inspire the masses to become financial through the wild building God's kingdom. On the show today, we have Mr. Eric Burstock. Mr. Eric is the author exactly. of three books titled The Confession of a Greedy Giver, The Table's Already Set, and Does Love Grow at Christmas? In this episode, we will discuss about generosity and what it means to give wholeheartedly and responsible. So thank you for being here, Mr. Eric. Oh, you're welcome, Dami. How, How you doing? You do I'm doing great. I'm doing great. Yeah. That's great. So my first question to start this, um, this conversation is, who is Mr. Eric? Outside of being an author of three books, who are you? Um, and what do you do outside being an author? Oh, okay. I have a, a very, um, I, I'd say, mature financial practice. I've been a CPA in the state of Virginia for 40, this is my 42nd year. And I do a lot of uh, personal financial planning for individuals and businesses. And uh, I think, uh, you know, I, you always try to convince yourself uh, that you know everything about money, but I learn something new every day. You can never know it all. And uh, you'd say, well, 42 years down the road, you kind of should know it all. Well, I learned from clients. I learn from little kids sometimes. It's just, you can never stop learning. And actually the, the ultimate teacher, the Lord teaches us about you know, our money, our resources, and, you know, how we can employ them to, uh, or deploy them, excuse me, to uh, further the gospel. No, that's not, I definitely like that. So what are some lessons you have learned as have stuck out throughout the years, you know, over this past 42 years? Right. Well, one of the, uh, the lessons that uh, actually had me write the Confessions of a Greedy Giver, uh, I'd like to say right up front is that, you know, I am actually, I was that greedy giver. And I realized at some point how miserable my life was uh, being a Christian and not giving my time, my talents, and money that the way I should. And I don't know a Christian that could be happy when you don't do those things, that we don't try to give our best. And I think the Lord, you know, clearly gave his best. And I being that greedy giver, at some point I made that turn in my life where you know, I put the Lord first and I looked at money totally differently. I looked at stewardship totally differently. And I realized that it's not just money. Like I said, it's our time, our talents, our energies, and also our money. So the whole purpose is to further the gospel. And the reality is that the gospel to spread it, it does take all those things, especially money. You know, everything's so costly today. So uh, that's that's basically where I came to that point where, you know, I just realized in my own life that I just needed to do more. And the reason why I wrote the book, uh, Confessions of a Greedy Giver, was to basically be ex be exponential in nature, that if I could myself give more, but I could also encourage others to give more, it becomes exponential in nature. And we could accomplish more with the gospel because things are expensive today. You know, now, you're 100 correct on that. You know, in order to move the gospel forward and to reach the four corners of this world, we need more resources, whether it's time and money. And you know, me doing some research recently, I realized in terms of money, um, specifically, like only three percent of Christians actually tithe. You know, whether oh, it's wow. or you know, scary. Um, yes, yeah, only three percent of Christians tithe. And I want to like, you know, ask, you know, why do you think? Um, Actually, I think I know why people do that. I feel like one of the reasons why 
has to do a lot with transparency in terms of how the church deal with money and things of that sort. So I want to right. ask, you know, how, how do you think, how can you think a church can um, communicate effectively, you know, the importance of giving to the congregation? You know, how can they explain to the congregation that it's important to give and the point right. of stewardship and their money the right way? Right. So, well, I think, I think the starting point would be to, you know, which I think is well communicated is that, you know, Jesus gave us everything we have besides our physical life. I mean, every resource that we have, uh, including our money, our time, and our talents comes from the Lord. So he gave us everything. So the question becomes, what is a fair amount to give back? I mean, do we keep it all? Do we spend it all? Do we buy everything we want in life? Do, do we say no to certain things? Like, you know, I don't really need that. I have a better use for that money. I can give it to the cause of Christ. I can give it to my church. I can give it to missionaries. I, I, I just want to further the gospel. And I can't afford this money. Uh, it's, 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 it's mine to hold, but it's also mine to use for the right purpose. So I think that would be the answer is that the church could just make, you know, it play a real big role in reminding people, which I think they do in a, in a great way, that, you know, it's not ours in the first place. What's up, family? If you would like to cop some fire Wealth in Christ merch, you can go to wealthinchristbrand.com. We have t-shirts, hoodies, sweatshirts, all available on wealthinchristbrand.com. Thank you guys for your support. Yeah, I understand, right? So I, I want to ask, do you think the church should be more transparent in terms of how they use the money? Because oftentimes, you know, people always question, like, you know, if the pastor's getting all the money, or the certain leadership in the in the church is gotcha. getting all the money. Um, so you think, do you think it's important for a church as a whole to be more right. transparent about how he uses different money? Um, so oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think a lot of members of churches feel like, you know, the money's going for the building. The money's going to pay payroll. And how, I mean, I want to, I want, I want the money to go back to get actually getting the gospel out. So I think it's yeah. very important that a church is clear that they're touching those areas is that we are using the money to further the gospel. We do have certain expenses, but a lot of your, the money that you give is actually impacting people's lives and, and, and reaching people. And I think that's, that's a critical element that you bring up. It just, it has to be made clear or else, you know, people lose the incentive to give. You know, ninety percent right because you know I happen to be ostracized. So I also like get to see the perspective of like, how people give, and some people always ask me, you know, right. I know what is going to. I'm just like I don't know. I just collect the money and go to the leadership, and that usually makes what a lot of people my age, my millennials and Gen Z, not want right. to give frequently compared to baby boomers and things of that sort to the church, uh, which is very interesting. Uh, I think right. the church we should let's talk more about it. You know, and show us that. It's not our money to give. It's not our right. money to give. This is God's money. And we exactly. should just give it back to him because he's going to you know, use it for his glory and it's going to benefit exactly. all of us as a whole. Right. Uh, which kind of leads me to want to kind of go back. I know I read in your biography that you converted from Judaism to Christianity. I want right. to you know, um, go into that. You know, What led you go from Judaism to Christianity? Uh, we can talk about that. You know, it's a heck of a while I could talk about that, but you know, it goes way back. I remember as a child that on, on, on a, more than one night, I'd go sit on the roof of my parents' car, being a Jewish kid, and I'd look up to the sky and I'd say, you know, God, I know you're up there, but I just wish you could be closer to me. I, I, I really would like to get to know you. And that was absent in my Jewish upbringing. I just, I just couldn't feel the closeness. And I was looking for closeness, even as a young child. And then uh, I had a very specific thing happen to me. Um, I think I was 14 years old at the time, and a real good friend of mine from high school, uh, actually was uh, junior high school, said to me, Eric, uh, would you like to come over for Christmas Eve? And I knew that if I went to my parents and said, can I go over to Mark's house tonight for Christmas Eve, actually, it probably was two, I gave him two days notice. And I, I knew what the answer would be in my mind. I said, they're going to say, Eric, you're Jewish. You can't, you, you can't go over for uh, your friend's house for Christmas Eve. But what they answered was, and I know the Lord intervened on that day. They said, uh, you can go be home by 10 o'clock. 
and wow. I couldn't believe it. They're going to let me go. So I go to Christmas Eve, and I hear songs like which I hadn't maybe heard, maybe I heard commercially, but I never really thought about it. Uh, the first Noel, born is the king of Israel. And I'm thinking, now, wait a minute. What is so non-Jewish about Christmas? And they had a gift for me at the end of the night. And all I could see was love, 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 love. And I said, you know what? Uh, I, I think it helped me point me towards Jesus, that, that Christmas was okay. You know, Christmas was really celebrating the Jewish Messiah. So that would be one major thing in my life. And then I met my wife. And this is really, this goes to the second book that I wrote, um, The uh, the Table's Already Set. I met my wife and she came up to me and said that she had just gotten saved. And I said, you know what, I've, I've never heard anything like that. Well, what do you mean you've been saved? Saved from what? She said, well, I dedicated my life to Christ and I, I've, I've been saved. And uh, we started to talk and she said, you know, uh, I actually, I accepted the Jewish Messiah. And I had never heard a non-Jew refer to the Jewish Messiah like that. And then she challenged me. She said, you know, um, would you be willing to read the New Testament? I said, well, you know, hon, uh, Bonnie, um, you know, we don't believe in the New Testament. Uh, I, I don't think I could read that. And she was smart. She said, Eric, would you read the Old Testament? I said, my book? I don't have any problem reading the Old Testament. I'll read the Old Testament. But what she didn't know is I set out to prove to her that there's no mention of Jesus in the Old Testament. So I started to read it. And I kept reading, reading, and reading. And I'd come to a verse and I'd say, why is this verse here? Why is this in our book? Then I go to another verse and say, wait, why is this there? I went to Isaiah 53. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. And with his stripes, we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Like, what is that doing in the Old Testament? So yeah. when I set out to dis to prove to her that I, 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 the Old Testament would prove that there's no mention of Jesus, it did the complete opposite to me. It yeah. confirmed that Jesus exists, it was spoken of clearly in the Old Testament. And then I had this great desire to read the New Testament and ultimately become a believer, which I did. Wow, 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 wow. That, that was very yeah. powerful. That was very powerful. Yeah. And I guess the question is, you know, why do you think a lot of Jewish nowadays still feel like the Messiah is yet to come, despite that, you know, yeah. still Bible, like, you know, Christ is spoken about in the Old Testament as well as in the New Testament? Great. That's a great question. The problem is there are only two types of Jews, as I see it, on the earth today. And one that ascribed to what we call rabbinical Judaism. So basically, whatever the rabbi says, or maybe in a Catholic church, whatever the priest would say, that's what they accept. So that's rabbinical Judaism. And that's where most Jewish people are stuck. On the other hand, is Messianic Judaism. And it becomes like, okay, who are we going to listen to? The rabbi or the Messiah? You see, but they don't know. Uh, they're, they're basically taught not to read the scriptures. They go to services and you talk to the average Jewish person and they're not reading the scriptures. And when I had the chance to read the scriptures is where I found Christ. So again, it's like if you said to a Jewish person, you know, that you, you know, this is a decision between heaven and hell. He'd go back to his rabbi and the rabbi would say, well, you know, you're Jewish, you're okay. That's really a Gentile problem. No, it's not a Gentile problem. It doesn't make a difference if you're Jew or Gentile. Everybody must accept the Messiah and, and, and gain eternal life. It's, it has nothing to do with our background, whether we're Jewish, Gentile, we're all the same. So yeah. uh, that's what's going on today is that most Jews listen to their rabbi. And a rabbi, I mean, is just simply a teacher. How about the ultimate teacher? How about yeah. the Messiah? How about Jesus? How about listen to what he said, which is both found in the Old and the New Testament? Hey, family, I hope you're enjoying this episode so far. And if you are and you have yet to subscribe to us here on YouTube, please hit the subscribe button. And also, if you're listening to us on Apple Podcasts and you have yet to leave us a five-star review, please do so. 
Now back to the episode. That's that's very, that's very um, powerful because you know even in Christianity you can also see like there's these two different kind of people as you mentioned in the Jewish right. faith people that just listen to the pastor or listen to the whoever's preaching and just run with that instead of actually going to the Bible and verifying you know what this pastor or what this preacher that he's saying right. um, like it hurts a lot of people especially in the generation where people get church hurt you know they feel like. You know, right. God is not real, and they go into all these different spirituality, um, which is it's just, it, it makes sense. Like you know, listening to you, it makes sense. Like this is right. nothing new. This is something that's been happening for years. Right. And uh, which kind of leaving? You know, how did you go from you know, you know, meeting Christ and now becoming a certified CPA for over forty two years? You know, what made you like want to get into finance? Oh, that, good question. It actually goes back to my Jewish roots. Uh, I actually wanted to be a professional ice hockey player. And that would never work with my parents. They said, Eric, you know, you're going to be educated and you basically have three choices. And they didn't really say it like that. But I, I said, okay, what are my choices? You need to be a lawyer, a doctor, or a CPA. So I took the second hardest, but they were really big into education and they just wanted us because, you know, when you go back to their history, you know, a lot of the Jewish people, when we first came over from Europe, could, no, could not get a job any more than working in a factory. If you were Jewish, for example, you couldn't work for the telephone company. You couldn't work where, uh, you know, you would think anyone could work. It's just, it was a lot of anti-Semitism. And the Jewish people, they said, you know what, in order to make it, get into a profession. Okay, doctors are needed. Lawyers are needed. Accountants are needed. CPAs are needed. You know, there's always going to be taxes. So it kind of was my heritage that kind of led me in that direction. And honestly, um, I think it's been a great profession. I get to meet people from all walks of life. And you wouldn't believe, like even in the book, Confessions of the Greedy Giver, I give examples of, of clients that have come into my office and presented financial problems that they had. And it's just unbelievable the amount of the different things that people get involved with that hurt their finances. And I, again, have this uh, th thought that, you know, I, I, at times I feel like I've seen everything or I've heard everything. And then I'll meet with a client and I, I see something that I've never seen before. Um, I actually had a client come in my office. And I spent 45 minutes trying to figure out what their financial problem was. They made yeah. enough, they made enough money. They drove very simple cars, old cars. Uh, their rent was like $500 a month. I couldn't find out, figure out where their problem was until uh, the husband slept. And he said, you know, we love dogs. Mm -hmm. I, said, how, I said, how much do you love dogs? And he said, well, we have 35 of them, 35. Wow. And actually, I'm, a book that I'm going to write, one of the chapters is going to be called 35 dogs is going to be the title. And the reason is you realize how much money they're spending on a monthly basis on 35 dogs. And I said, what? That's your problem. You can love dogs, but you're, you're spending your, your future. You can't do anything. You have no wiggle room in your budget because of those 35 dogs. And I had thought I'd seen everything, but I'd never seen anyone present with a financial problem related to 35 dogs. Okay. Wow. Well, that's, you just, that's very powerful. Uh, and, you know, thinking like not having to sit down and having to interview with you, it reminds me of this, I guess, the same, I don't, I don't know if I'll say, I'll say the same that a lot of people have, you know, in regards right. to Jewish people in terms of how they manage money and, you know, how they are like right. basically, you be Jewish, like almost they equate it to being wealthy. Um, right. Do you, um, do you see that as a person who was part of the Jewish culture and now right. mentioned what is, it helps, it helps in that aspect of building financial wealth? You know, we have that tendency to be very good with money. Like, for example, I mean, just to digress a little, I grew up in a very average income Jewish home. Now, I had relatives that were multimillionaires. And typically what would happen is, you know, you would learn from those more successful, which is, you know, a natural thing. But um, we seem to be very good. I mean... The Jewish people are also very good philanthropically. They're very good givers, okay? Uh, if you go to hospitals, if you go to, uh, you know, just various uh, 
uh, areas of life, you'll see that they're, they are big givers. So yes, they're very good at making money. They're vo also very good at giving money. And actually, when I grew up in the synagogue in the Jewish house of worship, if there was a Jewish person that had a business and they were failing, the other Jewish people in the synagogue would not allow that Jewish businessman to fail. It could even be a competitor, you see, mm -hmm. because they would help each other. So they're very good at making money. They're very good at helping others. But not all Jews are rich. Some Jews are, you know, middle class. And very few Jews, I said, are, would be poor. But I mean, you could live in a country where, you know, they hate the Jewish people and they could be very poor. In America, I think most J Jewish people do fairly well, but we're not all rich, you see. But I think the Lord has given us, I don't know, I, I, I think, you know, um, money is important. And I, I think we're very good at valuing the money. And we think before we spend and we tend to be good savers, but we're also good givers and, you know, that type of thing. And it, it's a it's a good lesson for anyone to learn from the Jewish people as to how they handle money. It's it's not a bad thing, but not all Jews are wealthy or rich, for that matter. I mean, a lot of them are just middle class average. And that's how I grew up. There are a lot of things that I wanted that my parents would say, you know, we just we just can't afford that. And that was a problem for me. And growing up with relatives that were wealthy, I mean, I, we would go to some of the fanciest country clubs with an uncle or an aunt. They'd wear the best clothes. They'd drive the best cars. But it never bothered me because I just, I didn't look at it that way. I didn't have to be rich. I, I mean, the richest people today that, and, and that live on the earth are those that believe in Christ, which is yeah. what, exactly what you're teaching is wealth in Christ. You cannot be any wealthier in life than Christ. And you could have all the money in the world. And, you know, I think of people like what Madoff did and stuff like that. Look what money did to someone like him. And, you know, it's not about money. It's, it's the wealth is, you know, we, we're going to live forever. We're pretty wealthy as Christians, right? No, you're right. You're 100% right, Christian. And I definitely appreciate you, you know, I'm sharing your experience as a Jewish person. Sure. And I want to, uh, you know, change the conversation a bit and talk about, you know, giving. You know, because you right. mentioned uh, the client that you mentioned, for example, you're saying that they were given, they were um, saving, but they spent a lot of money on dogs. And right. often in this journey of becoming financially free, you know, people always right. have this uh, bad habit that they cannot stop, whether, you know, the vacation, right. going out on dinner dates. Um, so what are some tips you can recommend people to, in order to avoid these, right. like, how going to mind that they don't know and they can't account right. for it. I, I think it's kind of like a, re a reversal that they have to do. I think a lot of people end up giving some, but really it's like the last thing on the totem pole is that they spend, they spend, they spend uh, all the things that they have to, you know, take care of. And then whatever's left, they may give some. We'll see if we could reverse the thinking, which, you know, we give first. Like, you know, non-Christians, what they teach is, you know, save 10% of whatever you make right up front, and the rest, you know, you can do whatever you want with. But with a Christian, I think the first thing we should do is give first, and whatever, you know, we feel is, is, is correct, and there's a lot of debate on that. Is it 10%? Is it 23%? Is it whatever you're comfortable giving? You know, we don't have to go there, but the fact that you... It, you know, you, you give first is number one. And then if you want to save, save some. And then thirdly, you know, you got to pay your bills. But just reverse the order. Give first. You see, and I think that's the problem, is that people give if there's anything left or, or sometimes what's left. And I've never seen anyone get hurt by giving. Some of the most successful people I see in retirement, they've given all their life. They've always given something. And... They typically have their mortgage paid off by the time they retire. They just don't have the debt. Uh, and the problem is, and that's another reason how we can give better, is there's so many things in the way. We take on, like, I don't need to drive the fanciest car. You know, I, I have a car that has everything you could ask for. I have heated seats. It's a luxury car. Okay, it's a great looking car. I have people come up to me and say, hey, I really like your car. What they don't understand, it, let me see, uh, this is 2023. My car is more than 10 years old. Wow. But it does everything that a new car would do. And I'm not picking on someone buying a car, but 
you know, I would really, I, I see young people going out and buying 35, 45, $60,000 cars. To me, it's, it's just unheard of, you know, that, you know, that buyer's remorse, you go out and buy a car and then that's the, the noose around your neck. You got to make the payments. So again, I'd say the main thing is, you know, give first. That's the first thing we should do as Christians and save some and then pay your bills. And if your bills are too high, find ways to reduce your bills. You know, uh, do you have to have the best satellite channel guide lineup? You know, do you have to have every channel out there? You, you know, there's ways you can save. And, and there's so many, so much competition for your money. Phone plans, yeah. satellite plans. It just, it just never ends. Utility is going high. Gas going high. So a lot of things are competing for your dollars. But if you give first, let the rest take care of itself. The Lord will bless it. He will, he will bless it by giving first. You know, when you get your check, make the first thing you write, you know, just further the gospel. So I guess my question is, how, how can someone put that into practice? But, you know, as human, are we naturally greedy? want to keep everything ourselves and take care of ourselves first and worry about right. everyone else. How can you put that into a, a daily habit that we can do and it comes within right. and do it over time? Um, again, just I think the first thing is the comprehension of the priorities. Okay, you're making money, you know, you got a job, uh, and, and the Lord, you know, was instrumental in putting you in a position where you earn money. So what's, let's just make the first thing before you pay for anything else. Just make giving first, the first check you write. Okay, the first check you write. You get paid, write a check, do, do, give something, you know. Um, so I think it's just the order. It's, that's the thing is what's first? What's first in your life? You see, and again, we all have to think about our brothers and sisters out here in the way that, you know, not a lot of people are not saved. They haven't heard yet. So we, yeah. we got the word out. So why would that not be our first priority? The first priority can't be saving for ourselves. The first priority can't be having the biggest mortgage payment that we could possibly have. So we have extra bedrooms when people, come, you know, so. Again, I think it's just the thinking is that what is the priority? The priority is giving, being a good steward, giving some back, okay, furthering the gospel, and then everything else is secondary. And I think people do that all the time, and they live very comfortable lives. I mean, you don't, it's not like you're giving away, you know, and what you give, what percentage, I mean, we're probably not going to discuss that today, because there's a lot of different opinions on that. And, you know, I think it comes down to a hard thing. You know, and that's the thing, your heart, let your heart tell you what to do. You know, it's got to be in your heart. The, the Lord doesn't want a, uh, a person that uh, really doesn't want to give. What is that? Grudgingly, I think is the, yeah. the term. It's, you know, it's got to be in your heart and you got to realize the importance of it. So once you understand the importance of it, you make it the first choice. And then, then, then you still have a lot of money to do things with. And sometimes you have to make, you know, compromises. I understand that. You may not be able to live in the fanciest place, drive the newest car, and uh, go out to eat as much, and you know all the different ways we find that, uh, to spend money. I would take care of the priority first, and the Lord will bless all the rest anyway. Okay, yeah. lose by giving. There's no such thing as losing by giving, and we actually will increase our wealth over time by giving first. So it's kind of opposite of what we would think, because we we always think tangible and physical, but Giving first, in the, in the end, we'll actually have more. We end up with more. So just those thoughts, I think, would help a person give. But making it the priority. I, yeah, I, I 100% agree. And I wish leading to want to ask my next question. My next question is, have you ever struggled with being, financial, being financially responsible while still being generous in your giving? And how did you overcome this challenge? Ah, uh -huh. that's a really good question. And I think that's why I wrote the book, Confessions of, the Gre of a Greedy Giver. I did something that probably was wrong because I, I didn't know any better. I left my employed and, and became self-employed. So I had a job and I said, you know what? I'm going to have my own business. And for like two years, at least, all I did was sink money into my business because I wanted to take care of my family. I wanted to succeed. And I gave nothing. I got to a point where two years that I was, I was the greediest of all givers. I didn't give anything for two years. And the Lord made it clear to me how wrong that was. I don't care what your other choices are in life. 
you always should give something. So uh, I myself, and I've seen many others, when they're so extended with debt and other expenses, it, it's just, it, it, it can be hard to start giving, but that's the thing that we have to do because even if you give some, even though you're struggling, you're gonna, it's gonna eventually help that struggle of, of your debts and stuff like that. So I think it's, it's more like a thing, you just have to get used to, it. it's a new thing. I'm giving first, but I have all these bills. Well, just do it. And over time, look back and say, okay, where am I now? Aren't I better off? I've been giving all this time and now, I mean, I'm no worse off. Um, and actually, arguably, in time, you'll be better off. So, yeah, I think people do struggle. I think it's a real struggle for some people. And I think I've experienced that struggle. There was a period of time where, I mean, it's just loaded up with debt. And I said, I, I would say, like, I, I don't know how I can give. If I give, then I'm going to be behind on something or I won't be able to eat as well. or I won't feed my, my, my family. But I think if we just give something and then ex increase it over time, uh, it all works out. The Lord will prove that he is right, that, we, that, that, that he's, gonna, he's taking care of us. A lot of times I think we think we're taking care of ourselves. And that's where we get scared about changing and giving up money for something other than what we're used to. But I think over time we get used to, we, we just learn to live that way and it's, it's the better way. It's the only way, you see. Uh, so my question is, can you discuss a few biblical principles and teaching on giving and how we can apply it to modern financial practice. Okay, yeah. Um, actually, um, the one thing is, you know, we're, we're full in Christ. So because of the position he has in our lives, um, we should be content whatever situation we're in. And part of that contentment is he will always show us a way out, okay? If we rely on our own intellect to solve all our financial problems, we're probably not going to get there. It, it becomes like intellect versus trust. We just have to trust him. And, and it's hard to do. I mean, a lot of people that are so used to trying to do it themselves, you kind of turn over the reins to him and say, look, here's all the money I'm going to give now make everything else work out. So it's more like just relying on what Christ can do for us. And then I think we also learn, like, what are the excesses in life? You know, where are there things that we're spending money on that is either become habitual in nature, that is just a habit? Is it, uh, you know, stopping on the way home from work and getting fast food to bring home three days a week because it's easier? You know, even fast food today, I mean, I, not too long ago, I went and got one of these pizzas at a fast food place, brought it home, and all we got was one pizza. It was really light in the box, and it was $31. I said, how did we spend $31, and we're getting nothing? So, again, I think it's just priorities is that what, what the scriptures teach us, and then also to be anxious for nothing and to be content and, you know, um, just to be good stewards. I mean, it's not our money. It's been a, it's a gift that's been given to us. So let's be very judicial as to how we spend it. Let's be very careful. Let's not waste money on things that we, you know, what do we need versus what we want? And the other thing is we have to realize is that we're being attacked. Um, Satan's greatest attack is, I think, against our money. He wants to attack us in that area. And all these ads you see on TV, the purpose is to make you discontent. If you're driving a vehicle and it's not new, you really need a new one. You, you really want to look like this, you see? And that's the thing is that we don't get caught up in that stuff. We realize that we're, in effect, it's an attack. It's, 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 we don't realize it, but uh, it's basically taking money away from the Lord's work is what it comes down to in our life, in our peace, financial peace. We've heard that term before. Financial peace is, you know, having enough and, and, and being able to give and, being able to help others. And that comes from Judaism. We, we always were brought up, you know, if someone needs money, help them a little, you know, always help your neighbor. And that's scriptural, you know. 
I guess on you know to um, to continue this conversation as as a finance as a CPA, you know, what right. five is you would tell people in this current economy um, to to become financially? Like, what are five steps you would tell people to take in order to become financially free and still put given in, in, in front as a priority? Yep. Okay. Um, one thing would be right off the bat, most people don't know where they're spending their money. Yeah. The, the, this word called budget. And everybody hates that word budget. But we, we really have to be aware of where we're spending our money. I mean, I, I've counseled people where they, they just have no idea where the money's going. They say, you know, they, they're always behind, but they don't know why. But we have to find out why. And then uh, once we know where we're spending the money, I think a second step would be, you know, where can we trim? Is there any place to trim? You see, now some people, and they're so overextended, they're, they may not find easy ways to trim. And I would probably also recommend, you know, get with someone, other people in the church. The church itself have people that, you know, they know finances and, and not be embarrassed, you know, and say, you know, I want some help with my finances. I want a budget and I want to find out what I can do proactively to change what's coming in versus what's going out. I mean, sometimes, I mean, could you take a second job? That's hard. Could you get a better job? You know, maybe you can. So maybe more can come in. And then on the going outside, you know, where am I wasting money? Where can I limit what I spend? So I'd say it's budgetary would be one thing is to really, you know, have a budget to know where the money's going. Um, the other thing is, you know, to distinguish between wants and needs. Mm -hmm. What do you need and what do you really want? You know, in theory, we want everything. You know, we all want uh, uh, more money. Uh, the question is, do we really need it? Okay. Uh, so that's another thing, distinguish between wants and needs. And then to recognize, I think from a Christian standpoint, that, you know, we have to be good stewards. This money is coming to us from the Lord. So we must, it is a mandate, we must get a hold and, and just do better with our money. You know, and I think we all try to do better. Another thing we could do, you know, if you were a business, every year, a business at, at the end of the year, they will tell you how many assets they have, whether they're liabilities, what's their income, what's their expenses. Why do we not do that as individuals? See, that's a little further than a budget. Budget yeah. is what comes in, what comes out. But how about every year seeing, is my net worth increasing? Okay, am I saving some? You say, what are my assets this year? Are my liabilities gone down? Or may, am, am, am I making more money? Uh, am I spending less? And that's hard. I mean, things keep getting more expensive. But again, a business does that all the time. Why as an individual do we not measure from year to year where we're going? So that's another thing we could do. So we could budget and, and, and then we can distinguish, you know, really make clear before we spend a dollar, do we really want something or do we need something? And then how about measuring our progress from year to year? Okay. And you can have a bad year. You could go backwards in one year. But what's the trend over five years? So I think that's another thing that people need to look at on a personal basis is we, we need to see, or are we, is our net worth increasing, okay, over time? And there's nothing wrong with a Christian's net, net worth increasing because there's a thing called retirement, okay? And that's another thing is that, think about retirement. That would be another point. Do we want to consume it all now? You know, that's why we're called consumers. You see, do we want to consume it all now? Well, what happens down the road? I mean, do we all want to just live on Social Security? I met someone years ago that that's all they had was Social Security. And wow. she was mid-70s, working in a Wendy's, and they used to uh, take the garbage out of garbage pans, pay all the big, heavy bags. And you had a 75-year-old woman carrying these bags to the garbage uh, spot. And the point is, she wasn't working at Wendy's because she wanted to. She was working at Wendy's at 75 years old because she had to. She had to, just to, to survive. So that's the point is that if we consume everything while we're young, what are we gonna have down the road? You see, and there are unforeseen things that are always gonna come up. Uh, and where's our reserve? Let's say the, the, the transmission goes in a car. Well, how do we get to work then? Say, so that thought process and those things that I mentioned, I don't know, it was actually five, but those are real, I'd say heavy hitters. Uh, and 
you know, you spoke about business and assets, you know, how do you recommend people to go about investing? Oh, there you go. Um, you know what? I, I think a lot of it is age related. I mean, in a lot of this you already know, and most people have heard is that, you know, the younger you are, the more risk you can take, you know, and risk is what is risk. I mean, the stock market and real estate historically have been the two assets that have done the best over time, but yeah. someone's, someone's in their seventies and eighties, you know, how much you want to have in the stock market is a whole different dynamic. But I mean, if someone's 20, 30 years old, and let's say they're, they're working for someone, I would say one thing to do is, especially when you're young, is to max out your retirement contributions, whether it be a 401k, uh, if you're self-employed, you, you know, there's other plans that you can have or doing IRAs. And again, I think when you're young, uh, I think it's, it's, it's great to want to invest in uh, stocks. And the beauty of something like a 401k is you're not putting money in a, all in at one time. You're kind of pacing the market. The term is called dollar cost averaging, where you put a little in every month and you end up, you're going to buy some uh, stock. Sometimes it's high, sometimes it's low, sometimes it's in the middle, but you're going to get the average. And again, historically stocks, real estate. But again, there are other ways to save. You could be conservative. Uh, you can uh, pay off your mortgage. A lot of people think from a stock, um, excuse me, from a tax standpoint, it's good to have a mortgage. Well, see, the tax law has changed. We kind of lost itemized deductions, and it's more into this standard deduction thing. And really, does the mortgage really help you from a tax standpoint? So the answer is really no. I much prefer waking up at age, you know, whatever age, 60, 65, and have, and if earlier, better to have no mortgage. Okay. Yeah. More, the word mortgage, I mean, actually comes from a French word. And basically, if you didn't pay your mortgage, uh, that you would, you, they kill you. It's a, like, you've heard the word mortuary. Yeah. Petition. It's the same root word mortgage. And it's like a noose around your neck. So again, uh, I pay my mortgage. Uh, I have a very short term mortgage, uh, only because I can afford to, but I put myself on a 12 year mortgage, wow. not a mortgage. And see, that's another thing with cars, for example, used to be, you go out and buy a car you pay it off in three years. And then they said, you know what? Now we have five-year car loans. Now we have seven-year car loans. Mm -hmm. Well, 30 years, you know, it's, that's the problem is that debt, you want to retire debt. That's one of the greatest things you can do as far as investments. I mentioned stocks. I mentioned real estate. I, I, I mentioned, and everybody wants your money too. I mean, insurance companies want your money in life insurance and annuities. Banks want your money in CDs and money market. The, the market, the stock, uh, uh, Wall Street wants your money and, yeah. and uh, that type of thing. And I think one thing you can do for yourself, uh, for yourself, which is different than all those three things, is reduce your debt, retire your debt. I mean, you could hear testimonies of people that own nothing. Can you imagine yeah. money coming in and not really having other than utilities and the basic things that you don't have debt. That's a great place to be. So that's one thing I'm a big fan of. It, to me, de-debting yourself is an investment. And, you know, I want to kind of go into what you call you brought up in sharing. And I know people have a lot of different perspectives on sharing. I want to ask, what is your perspective on using life insurance as a way right. to build? And how do you yeah. recommend your to do it? Good, to good question. Really good question. And I'll just tell you what I did, because what I did is what I really believed in. When my kids were young, and actually, when they were just born, I went out and got, bought a lot of insurance, but I bought term insurance, which only lasted till when they were like 20 something years old, because my opinion is that uh, you can't afford insurance for the rest of your life. And what a lot of people don't realize is these more um, cost, I mean, more costly investment, I mean, uh, insurance choices, like you've heard of whole life insurance, yeah. personal life insurance. Well, I can... Uh, plug holes and all those things. Whole life insurance is no other than a term insurance policy, but what you're doing is you're prepaying the term. Why would you want to prepay the term? You see, and I make clear to people that insurance is not an investment. Insurance people will try to make the case that insurance can be an investment. Well, what they show you usually is an illustration. And they say, look what you could do here, for example, in a universal life insurance policy. 
is that you can earn 8% on this uh, insurance policy, but it's all based on illustration. It's all based on assumptions. And the uh, disclaimer is very small print that uh, this may not actually happen, you see. So I'm a big fan of just buying basic term life insurance. I think that's basically what we're talking about is insurance. I don't see insurance as an investment. And though the insurance industry wants your money, just like the banking and, and, and the market, Wall Street, um, I'm a big fan of term insurance. That long as you cover, you know, if something happened to you, that it's all about the economics and you left a wife with children, okay? You, you wanna have that large insurance, you know, half a million dollars today. I mean, if you put half a million dollars in the bank today and earn 5% a year on it safely, you'd only be making 25,000 a year. But what the 500,000 or even if it was 200,000, it's a bridge. It gives your spouse time to readjust in life and you know, hopefully find a spouse and, you know. So again, I was a big fan of protecting when the kids were young. And I don't see having insurance at an older age as far as life insurance goes. Most people can't afford it because the premiums get too high. You become too much of a risk. Does that make sense? That 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 hundred percent that hundred percent makes sense. And I kind of want to yeah. ask, you know, since yeah. I'm sure you have various of clients, you have very wealthy clients, and you have right. clients, are, you know, working on becoming financially free. And I want to ask, you know, what do you what would you say separate those clients who are very wealthy from the ones right. that only work and becoming wealthy or becoming at least with having financial peace? Um, that's the right. way you. Um, what do you think? What are some things you would say separate those two different people? I think the first thing I would think of is that just realizing the de- the value of a dollar, mm-hmm. value of a dollar, is that when you make a dollar, and I realize we make multiple dollars, if we really value what we're making and what the Lord is allowing us to make, okay, and putting a high value on it, we'd be less likely to squander it, to waste it. And I think those that are wealthy, if and I'm talking about those that are wealthy, not because they inherited it. I mean, that, that's a different type of person. A person that knows how to value the dollar, how to save for the future. Like we were talking, like, you know, you, you can't consume it all, you know, too early because we're not going to have it at the end. So you, you learn about the value of the dollar. You, uh, you, you, you save it. And as for a Christian, I honestly believe that if we learn to give, the Lord will bless us. It's not a reciprocal system. It's not that the Lord says, if you give, I'm going to make you wealthy. It doesn't work like that. But again, I think the Lord will always take care of a giver. Okay. But those that are real successful, I think they've learned the value of a dollar and they really appreciate the fact that they're able to make that dollar and they're very careful how they spend, spend their money. And they know about saving and they're able to distinguish between wants and needs. You see, uh, a lot of the wealthy people, I mean, I know like Walmart, for example, there's a story on the last few years of Sam Walton's life, the guy who, you know, uh, Walmart, he drove like a beat up Ford truck. That doesn't mean that everybody has to drive a beat up vehicle. But the point is that man got it. He said, it's a shiny piece of metal. It's functional. It works. It gets me down the road. I don't need anyone to tell me, hey, listen, look, at that. you know, you really have a, a really nice car there. Uh, mm-hmm. It's not necessary. So I, I basically, I just think it's the value you put on a dollar. If you don't realize how important it is that you, you'll squander it, you won't, you won't, you won't, you won't become wealthy. You know, you'll just spend it. You say. I, def- I definitely agree with you. Um, and I, I want to kind of add, because you brought up, you know, it's important to give in this kind of conversation. We're talking about generosity and right. to point here. But I want to ask you, what are some benefits, you know, that you, you just mentioned that it's not like, you know, you give a dollar and God gives you a dollar back. So what are some right. benefits that people can expect to get if it's not a dollar, dollar kind of transaction? Right. Uh, what are some right. benefits you receive uh, from giving? Right. Well, um, I'd say right at the top of it is, I think we're fulfilling our obligation as a Christian to to give to others. And just, you're a totally different person 
when you're able to help someone else. You know, it's not all about you. And I, I realize when I say you, you know, we all have, you know, we may have a spouse, you know, we could be single, but we could have kids. So we are helping our family. But I think we, have, we need to look beyond our family. And, you know, if someone needs a little help, isn't it great? How do you feel when you help someone else? Yeah. Do you expect anything in return? You know, I've given people money before where I really thought they needed it. And I absolutely told them, do not even attempt to, to pay me back. If I help you down the road, you're going to help someone else. So it's a great lesson. And uh, I just think is that uh, it makes you more positive. Okay. And being positive will help you make more money. And uh, I think it's what the Lord, we don't want to be stingy with our money. Okay. We don't want to keep it. It's not all for ourselves. And just sharing is it's just a great feeling. And uh, I think it teaches us that um, in the end, we get rewarded is, is actually what I say, is that we end up with a reward for, for just not being so attached to our money and sharing it when we can. Some people can't share it. It's great to get to that position where you can, you know, and sharing could be small. You could just buy someone. Uh, I've seen people do it uh, on a fast food line going through a drive through they pay for someone's meal that's coming through next, you know? I mean, it could be small, but I think it's a good habit because you're not focusing totally on yourself. And sometimes when you just focus on yourself, you go nowhere in life. When you focus on the bigger picture, you know, one, the, the main thing is the gospel, but just being able to help others, you end up helping yourself. You don't even realize it. It just happens. And that's how the Lord works. I, I think it's one of the laws of the Lord. I mean, that's, it's just... It's, it's way back in the Old Testament, you know, yeah. your neighbor, neighbor like yourself, if your neighbor needs help, you know, help them. If you can't afford to, do what you can, you know, so. Uh, that's, that's very powerful. And I want to ask you, you know, this general sure. question in this interview, you know, sure. I see that you're really a man of faith and, and God has helped you in this journey of becoming financially free. I want to ask, how has your faith helped you in this journey of becoming financially free? Um, actually it's, it's almost like that song, that hymn, uh, trust and obey. When you learn to trust the Lord, I mean, I think your faith just grows exponentially. You know, it's, I, I trust me to a certain degree, but again, I know I err and I'm a sinner and that I will not make all the best decisions in life, but I really try to live my life like on a daily basis. Because I, do, I think about this a lot of times at night. I say to myself when I'm praying before I go to sleep, how many times during the day did I actually ask the Lord before I did something? Mm -hmm. He's there all the time. Yeah. And some, the answer is maybe sometimes it's maybe five times. And hopefully, I mean, I'm sure there's been days where I just lived on my own, you know, just made all my own financial decisions and other decisions without ever talking to the Lord. And it doesn't have to be a long conversation. He's with us all the time. He's our, our buddy system. He's with us. And before we do things, see what he thinks about it. Do you think this is a good idea? Do you think this is a bad idea? Do you think there's something better I could do? And actually, it extends to so many other things. It's not just money. It's just like, you know, like, what did I just say to my wife? Did I... Could I have said that better? Was there a nicer way? And not just your wife, it could be anybody, you know, dealing with people at work. And, you know, again, is that if you just go to the Lord as your resource, because he walks and talks, he, he's with us all the time, your whole life changes. And the financial stuff, I mean, again, asking him first, it's a good source, better source than me, you know, better source than any book, better, better source of, than any program, you know, it's the Lord. And, and it's, it's basically what you're all about, wealth in Christ, yeah. right there. That's where we get our wealth from. And, and, and not just the eternal life, but I think if we use him as our guide, we'll be wealthy in every way possible. And wealth is just, you know, to me means comfortable. It doesn't need to be mean, you know, I have endless money, but just being comfortable. I think is, is, is a great goal, you know, just to be comfortable. 
and be able to tell, you know, that, uh, you know, the Lord's helped you and, and just thank him for it. I definitely, I definitely agree with you. Like just being comfortable is more than just, is enough to say you're wealthy. Cause you know, you look at just in America, you know, you make right. at least $4,000, that puts you like in the top percent in the whole right. world. A lot of people are not even making that kind of money on a lot no. of places. So, and, you know, my last question to wrap this on this conversation, I want to ask you, what are some resources that people can tap into who are watching it, this on YouTube and hearing this, you know, they can tap into to help them structure their financial plan, where they're given, where they're, you know, cutting out debt. What are some resources people can tap into to help achieve financial right. freedom? You know, there are a couple of really good books that I even mentioned in my book, uh, I think everybody should read a book called The Richest Man in Babylon. Have you ever heard of that one? Yes, uh, I have that book before. Great book. Really great book. Um, uh, there's another book called The Wealthy Barber. It was really uh, a real simple uh, way to learn. Uh, and then, you know, on the internet today, there's so many things that you can read. It's all over the place. Uh, you can almost ask any question on the internet and get an answer. So whatever you're thinking about, ask the question. And not that you accept everything you read, because a lot of times you have to, a lot of the answers you get on the internet, they're, they're not really verifiable, okay? Is that um, if they are verifiable, you, you want to use that type of source, but you got to be careful too what you read, because sometimes when people come from a non-Christian viewpoint, you're not going to get what you're looking for as, as a Christian. So right. it's, um, the Bible is one great source. I mean, the, the greatest source, because the Bible does talk about money. And I honestly wish pastors would talk more about money, but they're kind of afraid to, because yeah. they don't want to give people the impression that the reason why you're here is to give us money. So they're very careful about that. But, you know, we have to talk about money. It's important in, uh, for the gospel. But it's also, as individuals, I, I think every church should have a, a class I mean, I've taught basic financial uh, concepts, and even in Sunday school, I've done it, where a pastor says, you know, I think my people need to know this, because yes, they could ultimately give more by learning more about finances, but I think uh, there's like, uh, there used to be Larry Burkett, um, and I don't know if his stuff is still out there. He passed away years ago, but um, I know Dave Ramsey does a lot in the area of um, financial peace. And it's not that I agree with everything they say, but I think that's another good resource is that everybody uh, should at least get a good Christian resource that talks about wealth, giving, and, and does it all on a balanced basis, basis you know. Uh, and you don't necessarily get that from secular sources. And I just, you know, just read books by other Christians uh, uh, that, that talk about money. Um, uh, so I, I guess that's basically what I would say. You know, there, there, there are resources out there. It's just, um, you know, the ones that come to the churches that comes to mind is like the Dave Ramsey stuff like that. Yeah. But actually encourage your pastor to, let's have a, a class on finances. Every church should have that. You know, we want to help everybody in the church where they live, you know, in their real life. And that ultimately helps the church, you see. So. Uh, yeah, you're 100 percent right. And just you know, while doing our research and coming to understanding that only three percent of Christians, you know, give back right. or give type, you know, like you look you look at the different reasons why they don't give. You see the more the reason, the more reason why most people don't give is one, they don't understand it. They don't understand like even from a biblical perspective, right. which we have spoken about. And as well, you know, the church. You know, they don't speak about it. They don't talk about this is why you should be good steward of your money. So I 100% agree with you that right. pastors and leaders in the church should not shy away from the conversation of money, but actually indulge in it and have more conversation and invite other people if they're not equipped um, right. to help people, you know, understand how they can use their money to help build God's kingdom. Um, so I want right. to say thank you, Mr. Eric. For oh, you're welcome. For your time. Um, right. Before I wrap this up, I want to ask you um, if you can give us a closing word of wisdom, like a word of wisdom, what would that word of wisdom be for anyone who may be listening or be watching us on YouTube? What would that word of wisdom be? Um, to be patient with your finances. A lot of things don't happen overnight, but just get on a track and just 
keep going down the track and don't give up. And like, for example, uh, this podcast, this is a great resource right here for people to, to just, it's, it's part of the encouragement. Okay. We're not alone when it comes to trying to figure out what to do with our finances. We have a lot of people that can help us. And like, for example, your program is just one example is that mm-hmm. along the way, just keep going down the track and keep listening to positive things. Okay. And again, uh, I think that's the key, you know, it's just not, not to give up and, and not to fail. Like ever anyone to feel like they're a failure. We're all failures. If we look at our past, you see, the beauty is that the Lord is forward looking. What well, we need to concentrate on going forward and whether that be finances, you know, um, we just need to work, forget the past. Just let's, we can learn from the past, but let, let's go forward. The Lord's not holding the past against us. He's, he's interested in our future. So I don't care where someone's been or how they've failed in the past or the mistakes they've made. Be forward looking and just keep learning. That's another important thing. Keep learning, learning from the Bible, learning from the Christian resources, learning from, for example, your podcast here. Just keep learning and going forward. Would be my oh, thank answer. you so very much, Eric Bursa. And where can people find right. you and stay in contact with you? Well, you know, my the books are for sale on Amazon, and I'm not really worried about the book sales. But um, I would encourage anyone to 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 read my books. And if they don't want to go on Amazon, they can con- contact me. I even send out free books. I never wrote for money. I never wrote for fame. I said if that was the case, I wasn't interested. So. I can be reached by, I can give my email is uh, my initials, E for Eric, G for George, B for boy, uh, 1955 at yahoo.com. So anyone can email me with any question. Um, I'm willing to give out my phone number if anyone needs advice and needs help with something, 540-303-2330. I even have, you know, I have an author site, ericburstockauthor.com. But uh, again, uh, I am... uh, I'm available to anyone. I've helped a lot of people. Uh, and a lot of times, if people don't have the money to get help, I'm, I'm just glad to help. So is there anything else you think I could give out that would help people reach me? If, uh, uh, I think that that's pretty good. That, that would do, do just fine. I want to say thank you again, Mr. You're Alex. Welcome. I mean, for those who are listening, I hope you guys don't see another person on the Welcome Christ show, another story right. about how they reach financial freedom. I hope this encourages you. I hope this inspires you. And we are looking for a group of Christians who are working towards becoming financially free. Look no further and join the Pray in the Vest group on Facebook and stay tuned right. for the next episode. Thank you again, right. Mr. Aaron, for a You're welcome. And I'm on Facebook too. Yeah, so you guys can definitely follow Mr. Eric right. on Facebook. Thank you again, Mr. Eric. You got it. Thank you so much, Tommy.